I want to again welcome this morning, and you're here for the beginning of a Christmas sermon series called The Characters of Christmas. And uh, in this brief uh, series that leads up to and including our Christmas Eve service, I'm going to be directing your attention to some of the lesser celebrated characters that are involved in the Christmas story as we consider some of the lessons that their examples can teach us even today. But I want to begin by calling out some of you for committing an unspeakable sin. <laughs> Now, I know from lurking on social media that a few of you here today are guilty of putting up your Christmas decorations before Thanksgiving this year. And uh, obviously, you don't know that there's that verse in Leviticus that says you're not supposed to do that. But since 2020 has been such a crazy year, uh, and we're all longing for some comfort and joy, I think God will have mercy on your souls, all right? But... The Christmas season is really a special season of the year. And one of the things that makes it so unique is all the decorations that we get to enjoy this time of the year. So, you know, we pull out the tree, we hang the ornaments, we string the lights on the inside and outside of our homes. We buy special wrapping paper and bows for the gifts that will be given. We replace our normal dinnerware, perhaps, with special winter-themed plates and bowls. And in our house in recent years, my wife Lori has added a few extra additions to our Christmas decor. A couple of years ago, we were eating at the Cracker Barrel restaurant, and as I was at the counter paying the bill, she was in the shopping area. And she found something that caught her fancy. It was this. She calls it Rhonda the Reindeer. <laughs> yeah, it's got to have a name too, you know? And, and since then, she's had an eye for these animals with, you know, that have the legs that kind of dangle over your mantle or your shelf. And so we've got this growing collection of these things that uh, are around our house that come out uh, every year. And last but not least, uh, most of you, like we, have a nativity scene that we set up. Now, ours is a ceramic set, and over the years, having four kids, two of them boys, uh, baby Jesus has lost an arm or two, and one of the wise men was actually decapitated uh, one year, but they've all been repaired and are safely and securely on display as part of our Christmas decorations. I love nativity scenes, though. I love the, the diversity of nativity scenes. And sometimes you can tell where a nativity scene was purchased just by uh, the way it's, it's uh, formed, by the landscape, by the materials it's made of. If you, for instance, buy your nativity scene here in Florida, it probably came with a palm tree or two, right? Um, sometimes you can tell where a nativity scene was purchased by the color of the skin of the, the people in the scene. But almost all nativity scenes have the same characters in common. You typically have a stable with some animals. Of course, you have baby Jesus in the manger, and usually kneeling right beside him is Mary. Somewhere maybe more in the background typically is Joseph. You have the three wise men coming. Now, by the way, don't email me and say, oh, the Bible never says there were three. I know that, you know, get over it. There were three wise men, okay? And, and then you have the shepherds. And, and maybe even in your nativity, there's an angel lurking uh, over the, the manger scene. Now, here's the thing. At no point in the actual Christmas story were all of these people together. The wise men, no matter how many there were, didn't come until sometime after Jesus was born. We're not told if there were any animals nearby or even if there was an angel by the manger. But we put all of those people into the nativity scene because they're all a part of the story of the birth of Jesus. So what I wanna do this week and next and on Christmas Eve is focus on a few of the characters 
that play an important role in the birth of Jesus, but they maybe don't get the attention that they deserve. So let's launch into the first teaching this morning, and let me do so by telling you the story about a boy who was writing a paper at his elementary school about childbirth. And so he went to ask his mother how she was born. And of course, she was a little prudish, and she said, well, honey, the stork brought you. Well, uh, how about dad? How was daddy born? Well, she said the stork brought him too. Well, how about grandpa and grandma? How were they born? Well, the stork brought them as well, the mother said as she began to squirm a little. So a few days later, his teacher was very confused by the very first sentence of his paper, which said, this has been a very difficult assignment to complete as there has not been a natural childbirth in our family for three generations. <laughs> well, the story of Jesus, as you know, begins with a very unnatural birth. But it's not just the story of one unnatural birth, but two. We need to meet two very important characters in this story. Their names are Zachariah and Elizabeth. And we start reading about them in Luke's gospel, the very first chapter. And what they're going to do is they're going to help some of us this Christmas season have some extra faith. Open your Bibles. And, and, uh, and by the way, I was in a bookstore the other day. And did you know that the Bible is actually in print? It's a book now. Isn't that crazy? But if you don't have the book with you, you can get your cell phone or your other device and you can join us on the YouVersion Bible app as well. I'd encourage those of you at home to do that. Uh, you can find the scripture and all the, uh, the outline there on the YouVersion Bible app. Luke chapter 1 is where we're going to begin the story this morning. Beginning at verse 7, it says, In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. So immediately we learn three things about Zach and Liz. The first thing we learn is they were very good people. Luke says they lived life the way God wanted them to live. They, they based their obedience on the promises of a God who had not spoken to Israel for several hundred years. Now pause right there and, and just think about that. Try to wrap your mind around that. Between the book of Malachi and the book of Matthew, the Old Testament and the New Testament, it may just be one or two pages in your Bible, but that's a span of 700 or 400 years where there's been no prophet of God, no fresh word from God. 400 years without any word from God, and, and yet these people are continuing to live according to the word of God, the God who's been silent for a long, long time. So they're very good people. It also says they're very old people. I mean, a wild night for these two would include Metamucil and watching reruns of Matlock, you know. Um, some of you understand that and, and get a chuckle out of that. These are very good people. They're very old people. And to a degree, they're very sad people. Because in their culture, few things, uh, few burdens were harder to bear than barrenness. Not having children meant a lot more than, than just an empty home. It meant that they had no one to leave their family inheritance to. It meant that they had no one that they could count on to take care of them when they got old. And it meant in the eyes of some that they must be under the judgment of God for some reason. Because barrenness, childlessness was often viewed as a curse. But the text is clear. There is nothing about the way Zach and Liz have been living that would explain why their desperate prayers have not been answered. 
So they were very sad people. They're very old people. And they're very good people. But here's the thing. Bad things do happen to good people. And yet what impresses me about Zach and Liz is that they keep serving God. The God that they haven't heard from in over 400 years. The God who hasn't answered their own personal prayers. They just keep showing up at the temple and worshiping this God. Now, before we read any further, let me set the context. Way, way back in the times of King David, he divided all the priests into divisions because there were too many of them to serve in the temple at the same time. So twice a year, it would be your division's turn and you would be responsible for carrying out the duties of the temple for one week. So it was about to be Zechariah's division's turn. And one of the things, one of the responsibilities that the priest had was to uh, light some incense before the altar of the Lord in the holy of holy places. They had a lottery. They drew numbers for this. And uh, this time, Zach got chosen. Now, this only happened probably once in a lifetime for a priest. So Zach is pumped. He's finally going to get to do something that has been on his bucket list forever. And he doesn't know exactly what to expect, but he, he does expect one thing. There's not going to be, there's not supposed to be anybody else in the holy room. But you know what? God is full of surprises. So continue reading in chapter 1 of Luke in verse 11. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayers have been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. And the angel went on to say some other very important things. This child was going to be full of the Holy Spirit, even from the womb. And this child was going to receive a very special assignment to prepare the people for the arrival of God's Messiah. Now think about it. After centuries of silence, God is about to make the most important redemptive move in history. And the very first person... To hear about it is Zechariah. Now, how is he going to respond? Because, I mean, this is, this is really big. This has personal significance. It means he and Elizabeth are going to, at long last, be parents. But even beyond that, it has national significance. Israel's Messiah is about to come. Well, look at what it says, or how he responded. Verse 18, Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. Now the angel I'm imagining is probably going, seriously? I mean, you need a sign? Dude, I am the sign. You know, be careful what you ask for. The angel says, oh man, you need a sign? Okay, if I'm not enough, I've got a sign for you. Look at verse 19. The angel told him, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I've been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens. Because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Now, while all this is going on inside the temple, people are outside wondering, what's taking Zach so long? Finally, he emerges from the temple and he starts playing charades, you know, sounds like, uh, you know, five words, and, you know, doing all this kind of stuff. Nobody knows what's going on. And then he goes home and he makes his wife Elizabeth, the happiest woman in the world for two reasons. Number one, because at long last she's pregnant. And number two, she's got a husband who can't offer his opinion for nine months. 
I mean, think about that, ladies. You've got a baby you've always wanted, and you've got a husband who ha will have to keep his mouth shut. I mean, Liz is living the dream, okay? Now, think about this, though. Zachariah's muteness maybe was a sign for Elizabeth to bolster her own confidence in the angel's revelation. I mean, suppose her husband had just come back home from the temple and said, Liz, you're never going to believe this. I was in the temple. I got to serve in the holy place, and I saw an angel, and the angel said, we're about to have a baby. His wife might have wondered, what have you been smoking besides incense, you know? Because here's the thing, for years and years and years, Elizabeth has poured out her heart to God. And she's asked for one thing, month after month after month, and the answer came back. And it broke her heart. And don't think that she didn't go through all of that for years without it depleting her hope tank as well. So here's what we learn about Zechariah and Elizabeth that I really admire. And that is, you can be faithful and not always be full of faith. See, here's the irony. Zechariah and Elizabeth, they know the story in the Old Testament about Abraham and Sarah. Now, if you're not familiar with that story, it's in the book of Genesis. And God says to this old man named Abraham, whose wife is also barren, I'm going to give you a child, and through your family, I'm going to bless the nations of the world. And they know that story. Zechariah and Elizabeth believe that story. They have stayed faithful all of these years to the God who made that promise to an older couple who were past the age of having a baby. But you see, it was easier for them to believe in a God who could do for others in the past than it was for them to believe in what God could do for them in the present. Can, can you relate to that? Can, can, we, can we relate to this story, especially in those times and places where, where maybe you and I are wrestling with the silence of God? And yet, Zechariah and Elizabeth kept showing up at the temple. They kept living the way God wanted, even with their hurts and their doubts. You've heard of Beethoven, the famous composer, and you've all probably heard that in the last years of his life, he was deaf. But do you know that in the last 15 years of his life, even though he could not hear, he still kept composing. He still kept writing music. He kept persisting even in the silence. You see, like Zach and Liz, I want to be faithful. And like Zach and Liz, I'm not always full of faith. So like Zach and Liz, I need, you need the message of Christmas. Especially for those times and those places in our lives where we could use some extra faith. See, here's what extra faith does. Extra faith believes first that God will answer every prayer at the right time in the right way. There's a book in the Bible in the New Testament called the book of Hebrews. And it has a whole chapter devoted to faith. And it defines faith this way. Faith is believing that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. That's what faith does. What the Bible does not say is that God is the God of the golden arches and he's going to bring your order to you right away exactly like you want it. So you and I then have to wrestle with believing that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him, but we don't always get exactly what we want exactly when we want it. See, I know people sometimes say, well, you know, I've been praying, preacher. I've been praying and praying and praying, and God, God hasn't answered my prayer. Well, I don't believe that. I don't believe in unanswered prayer. No is an answer, right? 
I mean, when your kids are whining and they say, why don't you answer me? And you say, I did answer you. I said, no. You know, that's an answer. But often when we pray, it's not that we get a clear no from God. It's just that we get silence. And what we do sometimes is we interpret the silence of God as a no, when in fact it may just be a not yet answer. Sometimes we give up on prayer long before God does. So in those silent seasons, we need to remember the example of Zechariah and Elizabeth, and we need to summon some extra faith to remember that while we think we know what we want and what's best for us, God knows what we need and when we need it. I, I love the story of the father who's walking down the hall past his little daughter's bedroom, and he sees her there on her knees by her bed with hands folded like she's praying. But she's, all she's doing is simply reciting the alphabet. So he says, honey, what are you doing? She said, I'm praying to God, daddy. He said, well, I'm sorry. It just sounded to me like you were just repeating the alphabet. She said, well, I didn't know exactly what to ask for, so I thought I'd just give God all the letters and he could do with it whatever he wants. Isn't that great? You know, we don't often know exactly what to pray for or to ask for, but the Bible says God's Holy Spirit is our autocorrect in prayer. God's Holy Spirit takes our prayers and says to the Father, now, Father, if they knew what we knew, what we know, this is how they would pray. Look at Romans chapter 8 with me, where the scripture says, for example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. See, our prayers never paralyze the sovereignty of God. So we pray and the Holy Spirit then takes those prayers and presents them to God in harmony with God's will so that God can work things out according to what is for our good and for his glory. So don't interpret God's silence as a no or as his absence. You keep showing up at the temple. You keep praying. Pray like David did in Psalm 143. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my plea. Answer me because you are faithful and righteous. God is so faithful even when you and I are not full of faith. God comes after people who are struggling to come after him. And, and people of extra faith know that. God's going to answer our prayers in the right way and at the right time. I'll tell you what else people of extra faith know. They know that God still surprises us with the way he demonstrates his faithfulness. See, the Christmas story, I love it because it is full of surprises. An angel just shows up in the sky above the shepherds after centuries of silence. In a culture that often dismissed the elderly like our own culture, God starts the story with two very old people. In a culture that was patriarchal and often pushed women to the side as being irrelevant, God gives the two leading roles to women. See, Christmas reminds us God refuses to stay inside the boxes that we try to put him in. And God refuses to be historic because his name is not I was, it's I am. And the angel challenged Zechariah and Elizabeth to have extra faith that God can inspire us and God can show up in our lives and God can surprise us in the present just as he did in the past. In fact, I think that's why God recorded and saved these stories in the Bible 
for us of the way he surprised others. So that it would give motivation for us to believe that he can still inspire. He can still appear. He can still surprise us. God wants to use somebody else's divine encounter like Zechariah and Elizabeth to encourage you and me to pray that we can have an encounter like that too. In fact, that's what happens in the Christmas story. It says later in Luke chapter 1 that the same angel that appears to Zechariah in the temple shows up to Mary with news of another amazing birth. And here's what the angel said to Mary. Chapter 1 of Luke, verse 36. Now Elizabeth, your relative, is also pregnant with a son, though she is very old. Everyone thought she couldn't have a baby, but she has been pregnant for six months. God can do anything. See, that's what extra faith will declare, that God can surprise us and God can demonstrate his faithfulness to us in ways that we couldn't even imagine. You see, it's easy to go through Christmas and really just keep all of the implications of the Christmas story in the past. But Christmas speaks directly into our present silence and says, Emmanuel is here. God is with us, not just was with us, but is with us. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. And Christmas reminds us that God still enters the world, even in those places and times that have often drained our faith. Some of you know, like Zechariah, that sometimes God answers a prayer in your life that maybe you stopped praying a long time ago. And you learn that there's often a lag time between what God is up to and your realization of what God has been up to. But we also learn something else. And that is that God is able to bless and surprise faithful people even when they're not always full of faith. Right now, some of you may be struggling with the silence of God. And here we come to the end of another year and you look back on this past year and you say, whew, this has been a tough year. I thought I knew what tough was, but then 2020 came along. And for some of you, this was the year that you learned maybe the cancer had come back. Or this was the year that you uh, struggled with getting pregnant, maybe like Zachariah and Elizabeth. Or this was the year of you watching one of your children wrestle with an addiction or continue to go on a path away from the Lord and all of your prayers on their behalf haven't seemed to change anything. Maybe 2020 was the year that you said goodbye to someone you really loved. Sad things happen to good people. And I think that's what the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth reminds us. That Christmas is the answer when you wonder if your faithfulness has mattered. All those years of trying to live for God, all those years of trying to be the person God wants you to be, all those prayers that you prayed, Christmas says God saw that. God hears that. Even when you can't see or hear him, God sees your faithfulness and it matters. At the right time and in the right way, God is going to answer those prayers. He's going to reveal himself to you in a most wonderful way. So keep showing up at the temple. You keep praying and you keep following God. In the early days of World War II, before the United States entered into the conflict, Britain and Germany were uh, in the throes of a great battle. And the British government printed posters in hopes of encouraging the resolve of their countrymen, even as the bombs from the German Blitzkrieg fell on their cities and their countryside. The first poster that they put up around the country said, your courage, 
your cheerfulness, your resolution will bring us victory. Later, another poster was printed and distributed that read, freedom is in peril. Defend it with all your might. They printed over two million copies of another poster that they never put up. They were saving it for the most dire of circumstances if there was an actual German invasion. Six decades later, cleaning out an old warehouse, the posters were found. Here's what it said. Keep calm and carry on. I like that message. When it's hard, when you wonder if all of it matters or not, keep calm and carry on. Show up at the temple, keep praying. Sad things do happen to good people, but so do God's surprises. The Hebrew writer didn't say keep calm and carry on. This is how he put it. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. God is with you. And Christmas reminds us that God is faithful. Amen. And may that memory give you some extra faith this Christmas season. Would you bow with me as we pray? So God, in the powerful name of Jesus, I bring you this prayer knowing that that even now your Holy Spirit is going to take this prayer like he takes all of our prayers and puts them before you so that you can work out our good and your glory. So God, with confidence, I pray right now a blessing on this church. I pray a blessing on people right now who are wrestling with silence. I pray right now a blessing, especially on the older generation of our saints in our church who've been so faithful, who have hung in there over the years, even when it was especially difficult to do so. Even in their deepest, darkest times, when their prayers seem to go unanswered. For all those, God, I pray that they would be shown your favor. Remind us that you are with us and God prepare our hearts for the way in which you want to reveal yourself to us even when we least expect it we don't want to miss whatever it is you're going to be doing next God so give us ears to hear give us eyes to see what you're all about and give us some extra faith so that we'll be there ready when the next miracle comes for all this, we pray, knowing that it'll bring honor to Jesus in his name. Amen. Amen. We conclude with an invitation hymn this morning, inviting you, if you have never made a confession of Jesus Christ as your Lord, to come forward and do so. You can experience a baptism into him this very hour. But whatever your decision, if you would just like prayer, if you'd like to be a member of this church and you're already an immersed believer we'd love to receive you upon the confession of your faith let's stand together and let's sing and if you have a decision come forward for all of you joining us at home we look forward to seeing you next week god bless mm -hmm.